I saw all of your lectures today, and I thought they were great. I thought they seemed very scientific, and I, you guys seem very intelligent. I'm very impressed. But the problem is the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, is saying something different from you. And it seems like they probably would know more than you. I mean, they're the United States Department of Agriculture. I assume it's the <laughs> smartest people with the most experience. Um, my uncle reads it, and you know, if the USDA says something, it seems like they would have the best, smartest people. So what, you know, how do we rectify that you're saying one thing that's different? The USDA is saying I should have dairy and cheese. Who should we believe? Like, Why should we think that you're accurate as opposed to them? Well, I th uh, my opinion is I think we should, should not have a good guy, bad guy view, uh, cowboy and Indian view, uh, black and white view of any of this stuff. That you have to understand that there's vested interest behind what I do and behind what the people at the agricultural department does. Uh, my vested interest is to bring truth and history and science and 62 years of experience at Hippocrates to the public. Their view is to regurgitate in their work what they learned at university at the agricultural school they went to. And remember, this is a revolving door between the agricultural community, Monsanto's, etc., and working for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's the same thing with the FDA. It's a revolving door between they and the pharmaceutical industry and the food industry. And uh, the most interesting conversation I had was uh, at a conference similar to this in front of physicians years ago when I met Dr. Kessler, who I really wasn't that fond of. I like everyone. I didn't like him very much. He's a former head of the FDA, and he came up to me and said, I used to think guys like you were quacks no more. Uh, I said, why did you lose, uh, leave the FDA? He said, because it was so corrupt I couldn't take another day. And he was an honest, good doctor who basically wanted the best for people. And I knew it because now what he's doing is working on childhood obesity which scares me more than all the other things when it comes to disease uh, that we've talked about today. Because if you think we're sick, you wait. You just wait until the next generation that are over 70% overweight, obese, or morbidly obese. So I don't think they have to be looked at as the bad guys. We're the good guys. I think it's knowledge, wisdom, and we've got to find a way to change the economy. Like Russia fell not because Ronald Reagan in America made them fall. They ran out of money. So if we say no to the people who are on the march for death, dying, and disease and cut off the money by saying we're not going to buy those products, I promise you, there won't be a war. It's going to be Mahatma Gandhi all over again. And we're going to end up, everyone, living this way. Um, I know that all of you do a lot of research. So should we consider the information we get on health, nutrition, diet, and medicine from the scientific studies accurate? Like if it says in the paper there was a scientific study done or you know, it was quoted in the newspaper, um, is that accurate or is there someone's financial interest behind it? Like how do you decide when you see a study whether you decide to accept it as credible or you decide that it was an industry-funded study <coughs> and therefore you don't give it credence? of experience and education to know how to interpret studies. But basically, we did learn that um, years ago, most of the studies were done by medical schools and independent authorities. But in today's, in the last 50 years, almost all the studies on drugs, for example, are paid for by the drug manufacturers themselves. And, they're, and they can publish the ones that they feel are favorable and not publish the ones that are unfavorable. We already know that most of the studies produced in this country are not um, excellent science, the let me say this one more time, that the majority of studies in medical journals are not non-biased. They are definitely biased and almost all doctors recognize that and are taught that as well. And that's why they have independent um, research groups like the Cochrane Analysis, an, um, a Scandinavian group that looks at studies on mammograms or on the, or flu vaccines or on antibiotics for um, strep throats because they're not tied with the drug industry. They're not the drug industry paying for the study, and they can give you, because we know in this country the American Cancer Society is financially tied to the mammogram um, companies, and we know that this, and all these things are based on, um, on economic benefit to the producers of the, of the, um, to the medical profession or the pharmaceutical companies. So the, the real reality is that 
we have to see who publishes the study, whether it's a, um, whether the analysis is called a meta-analysis, we're pooling many studies together, what are the studies in the pooled studies, how long we're we talking about, whether the studies are short-term studies, where they go on long enough to see the long-term dangers of a particular program, including medications. We know that um, we, we, medications are on the market for 20 years before we really fully recognize the dangers associated with them. And most medications eventually get pulled off the market after they're around for decades and decades because we find out they're dangerous as we put them on the market early on so we can, so there's much to be skeptical of in the scientific literature. And evidence-based medicine is basing your decisions on very scant evidence. <laughs> so we really have to be selective in what we're accepting as valuable evidence, and that takes some training and knowledge to be able to how to interpret studies and to recognize who's done the study, who's paid for it, when, and, and other factors we're discussing. So a good example is the, is whether, um, is the fact that, in spite of the fact that, let's say, um, the American task force or, or the preventive medicine task force no longer recommends mammograms between, let's say, the ages of 40 and 50. It's still recommended by other groups because they're affiliated with the mammogram companies and too much outcry and, and protest about people not making money on them and women want them because they're so brainwashed since birth that it's going to save lives. Mm -hmm. So it, everything is political and social and, and, and with our government too, this is a political system. And, <coughs> we, and it represents what the majority of people believe. And the studies are set up to support what people want to do and, what, and where the economic um, interests lie. And as you were saying, and as you were saying, Brian, as, as our society changes and many more people are demanding different type of care and different type of um, evidence, and di then we'll have government with electing officials and we'll have doctors who are more, or have practices that support what the populations want. But the change has to come from the mass of people educating themselves. It's not gonna come from the, um, the, the economically and politically powerful who want to maintain the status quo. Not usually, that's not usually the case. It's certainly not going to come from within the medical profession itself, because they're entrenched in what they're doing at the med present to make a living. And I, I'd like to add a, a, a few things. One, uh, just getting back to the USDA and, and some of the, the governing bodies that develop nutrition policy, and just to recognize that a lot of the scientific advisory boards um, actually do a really good job. Uh, they, they're looking at the science. And then once the um, interests of industry, uh, you know, they get their voices in, the, the, things change a little bit by the time it comes to the public because the agricultural, of course, USDA is a voice for farmers. They're also a voice for scientists. And to try to please everybody, there's going to be compromises. And unfortunately, those compromises sometimes mean, mean a compromise in the, in the bottom line final message. But do, do be aware, the USDA Nutrient Database is a wonderful resource. Uh, they have, um, the USDA has really uh, quite excellent summaries of, of nutrients and professional summaries and consumer summaries. There, there are some resources that are really quite exceptional. And so it's important to, to recognize that. And then in terms of scientific literature, <coughs> well, we have to be evidence-based in what we say. What are we using to be evidence-based? It's got to be scientific studies. And of course, as Dr. Furman was saying, we, we need to be somewhat selective, but we also need to recognize that what you see in the headlines is not always what the scientists were trying to say in their papers. And I'm going to give you an example because I think this is really important for you to understand. So in 2014, a meta-analysis came out by Chowd Hurry et al. Ch you know, this was a meta-analysis about saturated fats and uh, their effects on, on cardiovascular disease risk. And basically, the chowd hurry trial showed saturated fat intake, I mean, th this is what the researchers you know, ended up saying, didn't really have an influence on cardiovascular disease risk. And so, of course, the headlines were, butter is back, uh, you know, eat, eat all the lard you want. It was just, <laughs> it, it, basically, that's, that's what the media took from those studies. So, I, I'm looking at this study, and, and there were so many flaws, so many flaws. 
that you know Walter Willett from Harvard and his team came out with sort of a list of the flaws and they were comparing people who were consuming you know within countries similar amounts of saturated fats with people consuming just slightly more saturated fats so there wasn't going to be a huge difference in the risk but <coughs> if they compared between populations there were huge differences. Like the people from Japan, their saturated fat intake ranged from, I can't remember if it was four to seven percent versus the people in, you know, in some of the European countries, 12 or 14 percent. And the risk in, in cardiovascular disease was just absolutely hugely different. But the story I want to tell you is I noticed the third author on that trial was a lady by the name of Francesca Crow. And if you're familiar with Epic Oxford, the Epic Oxford studies that followed the, you know, the, the cohort that had about a third of the people vegetarian and vegan, she's one of the key authors. She was the author on the cataract study, I believe, that, that showed 40% um, you know, lower risk in, in vegans. And she, she did a lot of Epic Oxford. She was involved in a lot of Epic Oxford. And I thought, it just didn't make sense to me that she was involved in that study. So I contacted her and I said, you know, Dr. Crow, um, uh, what is, uh, how are you explaining the findings of this study? And she said, well, first of all, I was quite involved in this study uh, uh, until uh, I, I think she moved. Uh, and then it, she said, we actually, we actually uh, submitted the study to a journal. And what our findings were is that people eating the most saturated fat had about a 19% increased risk of cardiovascular disease relative to those eating, you know, high, higher amounts. And she said, our study was turned down because it didn't show anything new. Uh, so we've always known saturated fat increases LDL and it increases risk of heart disease. So what the, what the uh, senior author did was he reworked the data, removed certain things until he got a different outcome which was showing no difference. <coughs> and so she said it was resubmitted to another journal, and she said she only found out about it a week before it was actually released, and she had no ability to change anything, but she said what you need to know is this study changes nothing about what we've known about saturated fat and heart disease for 50 plus years. The clinical research is very clear. Saturated fat intake increases LDL and increases risk of cardiovascular disease, period. And she was one of the authors of that study. So just so you know, even when the media comes out with these big pronouncements, uh, it's, you really have to understand that they don't necessarily understand uh, the findings of these scientific studies, and they're not always clear. So what that study actually showed was if you replace, and what many studies that have suggested saturated fat isn't an issue, all they're really showing is if you replace saturated fat with refined carbohydrates, you are at no, uh, you have no improved risk of cardiovascular disease. Refined carbohydrates and saturated fats are not much different in, uh, different in terms of your risk of heart disease. Well, I'll just say one last thing. Pertinent to this conversation, in 1988, uh, here in the United States, which by the way, in 1988, we led the world. What America science gave, the world followed. We actually were going to radically change the food pyramid. Matter of fact, the Congress said this is it. And they were about ready to tell people to eat plant-based diets. This was extremely clear. The meats and the dairies triturated to the bottom. The vegetables and fruits went to the top. The grains went above the meats. And they halted it, the industry stepped in, the lobbyists stepped in in 1988. I think it was going to be published in January, and they halted it till April. It came back, and it was pretty much the same old thing with a few token vegetables thrown in on top of it. So I happen to agree with both of them. I think the thing that I, Anna Marie and I read the most is meta-studies where there's been 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 studies, and then you sort of see the thread that is equal among them, and then maybe there's some semblance of truth in this. Not always. <laughs> Maybe. Yes, we like studies that agree with what we did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We all have vested interests. <laughs> all my books I support with studies that I like. <laughs> I just want to say one more thing because uh, in Canada, uh, we are just on the cusp of a new food guide and new nutrition oh. recommendations. 
and uh, they are very strongly plant-based. Oh, that's And so the industry right now is having their say and, and not very happy with sort of what the final version is. So we shall see if the same thing happens. But there are many, many people on, you know, that have been writing to the government to say, please do not change a thing. So it keep your uh, ears tuned. We you, may have quite You make sure cherries at the top of that pyramid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs>